I talk a lot about what I think it takes to do a better job of software development. I describe the practices and behaviours at high-functioning teams and organisations, painting what some people seems like a rather idealistic, maybe even unrealistic picture of what it takes to do good software development that are seemingly impossible to achieve. But they aren't impossible to achieve or unrealistic because many organisations work in exactly the ways that I describe to great effect. But one common pushback that I get that is perfectly reasonable is, yes, that does sound great, but how do we get to there from where we are now? This is a perfectly reasonable question. So a while ago, I decided to try and answer it. What things make software development genuinely difficult and what can you do to address them? That's my topic for today. Hi, I'm Dave Farley and welcome to the Modern Software Engineering channel. If you haven't been here before, please do hit subscribe so that we can keep you informed of our content. And if you enjoy it today, hit like as well. In exploring this problem of software development, we started by collecting data on what people found difficult and got lots of answers. We grouped these answers and ended up with a collection of common, what we called anti-patterns. I then mapped another set of patterns, behaviors that I've found to help resolve these common prep problems represented by the anti-patterns. I ended up with an assessment and analysis tool for identifying problems and recommending possible techniques to address them. So given a recognizable problem, an anti-pattern, our model recommends a list of things that are likely to help to try and fix that problem. Patterns. This is too complex a thing to be perfectly reliable, but we did end up with a model that is practically useful and is a reasonable first approximation of how I go about helping teams to resolve their problems. It seemed to correlate very well with my subjective experience of what worked, and when I sanity checked it with friends who, who are knowledgeable in these areas, it seemed to make sense to them too. This was nice, but also a bit unwieldy, to be honest. So then, we tried to rationalize it a little bit further and end up with a list of 14 things, targets to aim for, that will lead you in healthy directions to improve your approach to software development. Here are those 14 things, and I've talked about them before on the channel. These are the markers for genuine continuous delivery. Next, we built a self-assessment tool as part of one of my training courses that allows people to score themselves and depending on their scores, we could then select some relevant advice to offer them to fix the problems that they find most pressing. We asked people to score themselves against each of our 14 targets on this scale. It's zero if you never do it and five if you do it all of the time. And then we used those scores to, to identify where they stood on the spectrum of achievement of our 14 goals and offered them targeted advice in each area as a result. This all worked out pretty well. And by now, over a couple of years later, we've collected over a thousand responses from over a hundred different companies. So now we've got even more data on what people who understand continuous delivery find difficult about it when attempting to adopt it. So here are the results. Remember, this is a self-selecting group. By the time that the people who have completed our assessment have done so, they've already studied my training course. So they know something about the definitions and the ideas behind all of these measures. So they're reasonably well informed. So we would hope, we'd expect that their scores are reasonably self-reflective. Based on their collected results, on average, this group of people are 53.2% of the way towards for expert level continuous delivery, as I define it. The top overall score is around 68%. So even the best performers, while doing well, still have a little way to go. Over the two years that we've been using this assessment tool, the average score has increased by 5.3%. So overall, it seems that we're getting better at building better software faster. Obviously, I'm going to attribute this to my training program and YouTube channel. So don't forget to subscribe and like now. And if you'd like to see how you're doing compared to everyone else, I have a really great deal for this week. 
you can get 30% off my Better Software Faster program, which includes access to the assessment and analysis tool that I've described here, as well as lots of other good stuff. So do check out the link in the description below. Let me pause there and say thank you to our sponsors. We're extremely fortunate to be sponsored by Equal Experts and Transfic, both extremely good friends of our channel. Equal Experts is a multinational consultancy built on the idea of applying the ideas and techniques that we discuss here on this channel every week and use that to create great software for their clients. All of these companies, though, offer products and services that are extremely well designed with the topics that we discuss here every week. So if you're looking for excellence in continuous delivery and software engineering, do check out their links in the description below. The scores on the 14 practices fall into three distinct groups, strong, weak, and I suppose developing. Some practices, three of the 14, stand out with an average score of well over 60%. Pipeline integrity, autonomous teams, and pipeline flow. That is, the pipeline is the only route to changing production. Teams are autonomous and can make progress without depending on people from outside the team. And all production change flows through version control. I should point out that several of these questions are subjective. But unless people are cheating on their submissions of these three, only the team autonomy question is based on subjective measures, really. After all, either all change to production flows through the pipeline, or it doesn't. And either all changes are version controlled on their way to production, or they aren't. Team autonomy, though, is a bit trickier, and a problem that you need smarter questions than mine to really pick it apart. I confess I find it rather encouraging that most teams consider themselves to be autonomous and so free to make changes and corrections as they find the need. This is an important score because autonomy is one of the main predictors of success in the Dora metrics. The weak scores are to questions that I would have predicted to be problematic. People struggle in particular with trunk-based development and automated testing. Everything else is mid-table, including the answers to question one, which scores just over 50%, which is an average score somewhere between we aren't confident how we do this and we could definitely improve on how we should do this. I highlight question one because this is really the whole game, the one question to rule them all, if you like. If you can't determine the releasability of your software at least once per day, whatever it is that you're doing really doesn't qualify as continuous delivery. So these mid-table scores, as well as the weak scores, represent serious opportunities for improvement. Fundamentally, I think that the reasons that trunk-based development and automated testing score so poorly are related because you need a core competency in automated testing as an inbuilt part of the development process to be able to achieve and operate with enough confidence to adopt trunk-based development. Trunk-based development matters because without it, continuous integration is impossible. And that's not strictly true because you can have continuous integration without trunk-based development as long as everyone still merges their changes to trunk at least once per day. But almost no one does that. And if they did, I'd have to question why they bother and don't just do away with the feature branches altogether. The most recent definition of continuous integration, recently updated by Martin Fowler, said that trunk-based development is a synonym for continuous integration and that continuous integration and feature branching are incompatible. I'd agree with that completely. I think this is unarguably true. After all, what can it mean to continuously integrate if change is hidden on a branch somewhere? The argument seems to be that even in continuous integration, we hold change separate in local copies, which is certainly true, but there's a very big difference between holding that change separate for the few minutes that it takes to type something new and commit it, and holding that change separate until we believe that the feature that we're working on is finished. From my conversation with people that are in favor of feature branching, they are mostly nervous of the idea of the code being broken all the time in trunk-based development. That's only likely to happen if everyone's either committing broken code or their changes clash with one another all the time. In reality, in continuous integration, this doesn't happen unless you're doing it wrong anyway. 
And what it takes to not happen are two things. A culture of never knowingly committing broken code, for which we need very good testing to show that our code isn't broken, and fast feedback so that the gap between committing something that we think is okay and it being validated as being okay is measured in a handful of minutes or so, so that we can commit code more often. This increase in commit frequency is what I think the feature branches tend to miss. If each commit is small and simple, it's less likely to cause a problem. By making it technically possible to make each change small and simple, and by developing the culture of making change in many small, simple steps, rather than fewer, bigger, more complex ones, we play to the strengths of continuous integration, and so are never very far away from a definitive working version of our system. So our system and our development process are both more stable overall as a result. If your build takes a long time or your tests aren't good enough to find most mistakes, things may break. And now you have to have all sorts of ways to cope with all of the breakages. If your tests aren't good enough, then they won't be good enough when your feature's finished either. So you're in the same position of creating code that you don't really trust, except that your feedback is slower. You're either finding out much later that there's a problem or you're not finding out at all, at least not until some poor user finds the problem for you. One of the characteristics of the approach to software development that I recommend is that things are often subtly linked. By pushing for faster feedback, we are in effect constantly stress testing our level of trust in what it is that we're building. If we don't trust our tests enough, the way to get everyone focused on better testing is to move faster. Continuous integration, trunk-based development, makes developers more aware that their changes may cause a problem because they may end up in production. So they're a little bit more cautious. They are willing to spend a little bit more thought and maybe even a little bit more time on testing their changes before they commit them. These are good things. It's a bit like the old joke, how do you improve road safety overnight? The idea is, is that you build a big spike in the middle of the steering wheel. So if you bump into something or stop too quickly, you're going to poke yourself with the spike. Trump-based development is part of the driver to make us test better. Better testing, though, is better with or without trunk-based development. This link is shown in our data that we collected. Eight organizations were excellent at both trunk-based development and test automation. 23 organizations were struggling on both, and only six were good at one but poor on the other. Advanced practices like this cluster together. Both of these things need engineering skill and technical maturity to achieve. There is a significant transition from the mid-level players to the elite players that's evident in the data. From safety through process for the mid-level players to safety through engineering for the elites. We used artificial intelligence to crunch the numbers for these, these assessments and it identified five groupings and offered us some decent insights. We don't have the data to correlate these findings with commercial or organisational success. I'll leave that to Dora. But these groupings do mirror the Dora findings that, as the AI pointed out, these behaviours cluster naturally. The data says that organisations tend to be mostly good or mostly bad. Continuous delivery as a practice is systemic. This resonates rather well with my subjective impressions. I think that this is part of what I think of as modern software engineering mindset that continuous delivery engenders. Organizations that do well at continuous delivery adopt an approach based on continuous improvement everywhere for everything and structure their thinking and end up working in a series of small controlled experiments for everything. Once you adopt this mindset, it's hard to avoid applying it everywhere to your work. You begin to question it and attempt to improve everything. This radar view shows the relative performance across 14 measures. I think that the important lessons that I take from this data, which again match my personal experience, is that the kind of change that most organizations need to make this improvement and, and for it to stick is broadly focused. They need to seek improvement on a wide variety of fronts. This is back to that problem of the elite being good at everything and the mid-level players being average at everything. 
The things that people find most difficult, though, are amongst the most important things to get right. Continuous integration, that synonym for trunk-based development, is central to the practice of continuous delivery. So finding routes to shortening feedback cycles and to improving on that are crucial for success. The good news, though, is that there is a strong technical component to solving this problem. The technical and technical problems are generally easier to deal with than organisational or cultural problems. So if you work in an organisation with good team autonomy, good flow through your pipelines, which my data says is average, but you're bad at automated testing and trunk-based development, then since your team is autonomous, it's now down to you how you choose to organise your work. So you could choose to fix this by steadily improving. Don't wait for somebody else to grant you permission or to show the way. Take on the responsibility and start making things better. I think a good place to start with this is in test automation. It's often the quickest win and will increase your confidence. If you don't already practice full test-driven development, and if you're not good at automated testing, you probably don't, then my advice is two-pronged. Start with acceptance testing via BDD. I think that this is a much easier place to begin with than attempting to retrofit test-driven development to pre-existing code. Inevitably, the second prong is to learn test-driven development and adopt it by default for all new code. But don't try and retrofit fine-grained TDD to old code. Instead, use acceptance testing to increase your confidence there and use TDD for all of the new stuff. The reason for this is that it's so much easier to adopt acceptance testing in these more complicated circumstances. As your skills and confidence in TDD increase, though, you'll be better able to decide how and where to retrofit the finer grained testing of TDD to your legacy code when it's going to be most useful. In general, my advice for this is only add TDD style tests to code that you need to work on. This isn't a beauty pageant. You don't get extra credit for going adding TDD tests to code that nobody ever touches. Good unit tests as generated via TDD shape the code. If your code wasn't written that way from the start, it's almost certainly the wrong shape. So by its nature, it's not easily testable. That means it's a lot of effort and rather disruptive effort to change code like this. That's not a very safe kind of change to make. So you'll need to approach it very carefully and you'll need to develop your skills in testing and in particular in refactoring before you're able to do this safely. There are lots more videos on this topic on the channel, so I recommend that you take a look if this is your problem. Thank you very much indeed for watching all the way to the end. And if you're a Patreon member, thank you for your support. And if you're not a Patreon member, please do consider joining. There's lots of additional benefits to doing so. Thank you and bye-bye.